Hello, welcome to the School of Sacred Mysteries. I am your host, Deborah Bell Foreman. This is the third class of the first course in the Master's Program in Alchemy at the end of the cycle with our teacher, Robert E. Cox. We will be covering materials in chapters 3, 4, possibly 5, depending on time, in the Pillar of Celestial Fire. Welcome, Robert. Hey, Deborah. Hi. Why don't we jump right in with the discussion of a very important uh, concept in your work, which is that of the divine messenger. Okay. Um, well, you know, I mean, there were many ancient traditions that had a deified concept of the divine messenger. Um, he was Tehuti or Thoth in the Egyptian tradition, God of Wisdom. Um, he was Sin, the God of Wisdom in the Semitic tradition, after whom the Sinai Desert was named, and Hermes in the in the Greek tradition, and Mercury in the Roman tradition. In the Vedic tradition, the Divine Messenger was represented by Agni and his father Angurus. I think we've discussed before that the word Angurus in Old Persian becomes Angeros. In Old Greek becomes Angelos. In Latin becomes Angelus. And in English becomes Angel. And Angurus was viewed as the prototypical messenger between gods and men. And Agni, his son, and the word Agni actually means fire or radiance, um, was also considered the divine messenger with which the, the rest of the followers of the Vedic tradition identified with. At the very beginning of the Rig Veda, the first phrase is Agni Ide, which means I identify myself with Agni. Now, <clears throat> these are all personifications of a general principle in nature, which is also symbolized by the rainbow, the seven colors of the rainbow. You know, the, uh, the covenant in the Bible between heaven and earth, um, that which links heaven and earth, the connection between heaven and earth. Um, and that's why in all, virtually all of these ancient traditions, if you go back to, to the very earliest traditions, you find discussions of seven seers and seven sages. Um, the, in the Vedic tradition, the Angirasas eventually branched out into seven branches, seven families of seers. And the, the patriarchs of those seven families were known as the seven seers. In the Egyptian tradition, you have in uh, at uh, uh, one of the temples, um, the Edfu temple in uh, in Egypt, which was reconstructed by the Ptolemies during the Alexandrian era, um, based upon, I'm sure, uh, ancient scrolls and instructions they found hidden away, squirreled away in, uh, by the Egyptian priesthood from the Old Kingdom. They reconstructed a temple on the basis of an older foundation, and they wrote uh, a text on the wall, a hieroglyphic text on the walls of this temple, which are called the Edfu Temple Text. And that, those texts describe the, uh, the period of time known in Egypt as Zeptepi, which is the first time, corresponds directly to Satya Yuga in the Vedic tradition, um, which is the first period of the cycle of time, lasting for 4,800 years, and which began sometime around, well, in the 11th century BC, sometime around 10,950 BC or so. Um, very long time ago. Um, but what the, the Edfu Temple texts describe is that at that time, during that period, 
seven sages walked the Nile Valley and mapped out the sacred mounds which would serve as the foundations of future temples and monuments throughout Egypt. And the in implication is that they were surveying the land of Egypt so that in future generations heaven could be mapped out on earth so that the land of Egypt could be fashioned in the image of heaven so that we have a kingdom of heaven on earth that is designed purposefully such that the kingdoms the sub kingdoms in that kingdom correspond to the kingdoms of heaven now again this is related back to the seven sages and we have seven seers in the Vedic tradition in the Sumerian tradition which is um, coexist in time with the old Vedic civilization called the Indus Saraswati civilization in Pakistan and northwestern India and the Egyptian civilization in, in Egypt along the Nile River the Vedic civilization was called Indus Saraswati because um, it was along the, the Indus and Saraswati rivers in uh, Pakistan and northwestern India um, and you had another river civilization or river civilization um, in uh, southern Iraq called the Sumerian civilization the land of Sumer um, which was along the um, Tigris and Euphrates rivers um, these were the largest contemporaneous and earliest civilizations that are known on earth um, with the Indus Saraswati civilization extending over an area um, approximately equal to all of Western Europe. Um, very large area, actually. And there were thousands uh, of villages and cities that have been discovered really since the, the 1920s. It's a much more recently found civilization than the Sumerian or the Sub Egyptian civilization but it was larger than the other two combined and it's now known that it was the civilization that first developed writing um, the Indus Saraswati script predates the Sumerian script which used to held the record uh, by some 200 years according to carbon dated dating methods and what so, date what date would that be I was around 3200 BC about the same time that the his first historical dynasty in Egypt was founded. And the, Egypt the Sumerian script appears around 3000 BC. So it was about 200 years earlier, according to the best, most calibrated carbon dating methods that they have. And uh, Egyptian script hieroglyphic um, doesn't show up in the archaeological record until we find the uh, Pyramid of Unas. Um, which was constructed around 26 something BC, um, you know, six to 400 years later. Uh, however, by that time, hieroglyphic was already a well developed language, so obviously um, it had, a, had been developed previously, probably on Egyptian papyri and scrolls, which um, have been lost and turned into dust. So that haven't been found. Maybe they were some of the scrolls that was in the Great Library of Alexandria that was destroyed in the fire. We don't know. But anyway, the what the, the earliest texts that they found were inscribed on stone on the uh, the walls of the tomb of Unus in the pyramid of Unus and in the antechamber of that pyramid. They were known as the pyramid texts, which are the oldest and most authoritative religious texts of ancient Egypt. Now, so you have three different civilizations, and the Sumerian civilization also, in its mythology, talks about seven Anunnaki, which was the 
Egyptian, the Sumerian word for the sons of God. The sons of Anu, the sons of the, the sun god, or the solar, or the sky god. And uh, there were seven in number. There were seven principal Anunnaki. So you have, what is this coincidence between seven seers in the Vedic tradition, seven seers, seven sages, or Anunnaki, seven sons of God in the, in the uh, Sumerian tradition, and seven sages in the Egyptian tradition. And I should also bring in the Hebrew tradition, which the esoteric aspect of the Hebrew tradition is called Kabbalah. And in Kabbalah, um, they map out the whole, whole overall organization of the universe, and there are seven highest, la seven highest layers within the created universe, which were identified with seven Elohim. And Elohim means Lord. Um, and Yahweh Elohim was the highest of those. And that is Jehovah, Jehovah Elohim, which is talked about in the uh, book of Genesis as being present in the Garden of Eden. That's the word for the Lord that, that inhabited the Garden of Eden was Jehovah Elohim. And according to the esoteric tradition of Kabbalah, Jehovah Elohim is actually a sevenfold reality. Um, in Hebrew, Jehovah is written by four Hebrew letters which are consonants in which the vowels are omitted um, the way the language is written. But they're, they're, the vowels are brought out in pronunciation. And when Yahweh is transliterated into English, it becomes Jehovah, which consists of seven letters, four consonants, and three vowels. Excuse me, may I ask a question? Just mm -hmm. is is uh, Yahweh the seventh or is Yahweh the entirety of the seven? The entire it is both. Uh -huh. Um it's the highest of the seven and it is the entirety of the seven. And the way you think about this is because the the highest of the seven is that which embraces the other six. You can think of these as spheres in which the outermost sphere is the largest sphere, the most all-embracing sphere, is symbolic of Yahweh, or Jehovah, Elohim, and there are seven smaller spheres, concentric inside the larger sphere, and those are the other six Elohim, and therefore Jehovah includes within himself the other six. In the Vedic tradition, this was understood um, symbolically as like the sun of the self, the sun of creation, the cosmic sun, which manifests itself in terms of seven rays. The seven, um, what they referred to, what the Hebrews referred to are the the sages of Kabbalah referred to as the seven Elohim, um, the Vedic tradition understood as seven all-powerful Purushas, which means cosmic souls. And these cosmic souls were identified with particular scales of reality, which are called the Sapta Kapalas, the seven shells of the cosmic egg. Interestingly enough, the word Kapala also means a skull. Um, as well as a shell, like the shell of an egg or the shell of the head, means the skull as well. So the seven skulls. Um, but these are basically layers of space-time geometry. Layers of consciousness. And the Vedic texts are very specific about them. They say that they are each layer is ten times larger than the previous. So they really represent powers of ten in terms of the expansion of space or expansion of consciousness. Volumetrically, that's a thousand-fold expansion. Um, and these seven, the seven-fold reality is, was said to be uncreated. Um, they were also called the, the seven talas or the seven foundations. 
of the universe. Um, Tala means a foundation. And these foundations were said to be composed of uncreated primordial substance, which reflects consciousness. It's a created substance, but, I mean, it's not a created substance. Um, yet it's not the same as the absolute. Um, it was uncreated matter energy or uncreated mind stuff, really, is what it represents. And it has different qualities like the colors of the rainbow. These qualities were known as the seven primordial elements, earth, water, fire, air, space, cosmic ego, and cosmic intelligence. With the outermost sphere being the embodiment of cosmic intelligence, which the Vedic seers identified with Swayambhu, the unborn creator. And according to the Vedic text, Angurus was born from the mouth, the hollow of the mouth of Swayambhu, the unborn creator. And Angurus was the highest, or the, the first of the seven rishis, the seven seers in the Vedic tradition. What that means is that Angurus is an incarnation of the sphere, the hollow sphere of Swayambhu. And the word Swayambhu means the self-existent. And um, he was the divine messenger between men on earth and the unborn creator in the heavens. And his seven counterparts were the incarnations of the other, his other six counterparts were the incarnations of the other six spheres, the other six shells, the other six layers. Um, now, this can be understood as they compared this to being like the sun, the unity of the seven as being the sun, identified with Swayambhu, who embraces all seven, including himself, which has seven rays, seven rays of the, like the seven colors of the rainbow. And that's why even in the Bible, um, the covenant between heaven and earth was described as the bow that shines in the sky, in other words, the rainbow, sevenfold rainbow. Now, what is it actually linking to? Well, to understand that, we have to understand what is within the seven shells and what is outside the seven shells. According to the Manusmriti, which is the memory of man, the oldest and most authoritative of the Vedic books of law, and, and as well as the, a number, number of Puranas or ancient texts of uh, ancient lore mythological lore, historical lore, and so on, in the Vedic tradition. Um, what lies within the seven shells is the created universe called the cosmic egg. And the seven shells are viewed as the shells of the cosmic egg. I mean, these are not hard shells. They're basically layers, spherical layers of space-time geometry, layers of consciousness that surround and embrace the cosmic egg. And when it's, I say, cog yeah, go ahead, Deborah. Uh, does that mean that the center is not number one? The center would be that egg, and then there's seven outer shells. Is that what? Is that right? So mm -hmm. the okay, yeah. okay, yeah, you can say that. Yeah, and the uh, the created form of the cosmic egg was said to embrace thirty two layers, which correspond to the thirty two vertebrae in the spine of the human being. This goes back to the analogy of why man is created in the image of the creator. And what rests upon the spine is the head, the skull. That's why the seven shells were compared to seven kapalas, seven skulls of the cosmic body. 
Um, so uh, this, these layers also within the created universe were said to be 10 times larger than the previous and the smallest of those layers was on the order of a digit which is a thumb width you know there's the old myth of Tom Thumb well, in the Vedic tradition there was a Purusha, a soul which has the, the form or the, the size Angushta Matra Matra means measure Angushta means thumb it was called the Angushta Matra Purusha, the Purusha, the soul, the size of a thumb, the measure of a thumb. And the thumb was a unit of measure throughout the ancient world, in, in Egypt, in, in uh, the Vedic tradition, in the Hebrew tradition, called the digit, which is a Latin word that means finger. It's approximately, it's an approximate unit, unit of measure because it's determined by the human body, the thumb width of the human body, approximately two centimeters. Was that at the joint? Did they take it at the joint or, or somewhere else? Across the fleshy pad of the thumb. Oh, okay. Two centimeters, okay. Yeah, and the thumb in the Vedic tradition represents the universal self. That's why, I don't know if you've ever seen or are familiar with the mudras, the hand gestures in the Vedic tradition, but often you'll see an image of some yogi sitting cross-legged in lotus position with his index finger touching his thumb and the other three fingers extended. That's a mudra. And what that mudra represents, the thumb represents the universal self, the index finger represents the individual self, and when they form a circle by touching the index finger to the tip of the thumb, um, you have the Ouroboros or the union of the individual self and the universal self. Um, and then the three fingers that are extended represent the three worlds, the three gunas, the three qualities which out of which everything else is created. But you, you have the self and the universe, so to speak. Um, at any rate, the... Uh, the 32nd layer up from that um, was known as the created form of the universe. And it, could, it was compared to a golden womb called Hiranyagarbha, which also means the golden egg. There's this whole myth about the goose that laid the golden egg and so on. Fairy tale stuff. Which word is golden and which word is egg? Hir Hiranya? Yeah. is golden, and garba means both egg and womb. It's the place where the embryo of creation is formed. Now, like an ordinary chicken egg, so to speak, um, there it contains a central spherical yolk when it's in its shell. Now the shell is oval and so on, but uh, the, the Vedic, this whole concept of the cosmic egg and shells was all spherical, not oval. Um, and there are some birds that lay basically spherical eggs as well. Uh, a chicken happens to lay an oval-shaped egg. Uh, they weren't necessarily talking about a chicken egg. They were talking about a cosmic egg. <laughs> 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 and in the... Uh, um, uh, at any rate, in the, at the center of the egg, when it's encased in the shell, there is a spherical golden yolk, which is the place where the embryo begins to form. But it's surrounded by a transparent fluid, an embryonic fluid. Now, of course, when you cook it, it becomes white, so you call it the egg white. But um, before it's cooked, it's transparent. And you have this golden egg surrounded by an embryonic fluid. And um, that golden egg exists on the level of the 32nd layer up. And the first cosmic shell that embraces that egg was called the shell of 
but that embraces that yolk. Let's call it a yolk rather than just egg, because the egg has both the yolk and the fluid. Um, the shell that embraces the yolk was called the earthen shell of the cosmic egg. Um, so to speak, it has the quality of mind stuff in it that is the most concrete of the seven grades of mind stuff. And it is the primordial clay out of which the created forms and phenomena of the universe are fashioned. Excuse me. Are you saying that the um, what would be the white... It, that's you're not speaking about that. You're speaking of beyond the white. Is that right? The the shell, the first shell is beyond the egg white. What would be no? The, it's it's just beyond the the egg yolk. Okay, so it is what would be the plot that uh, the white then. Is that mm -hmm. right? Okay, mm -hmm. okay. And actually, it was identified in the Vedic tradition as colored white. Um. And that is the station of the born creator known as Brahma. And that white shell that embraces the golden yoke was said to be the vehicle, the vahana of Lord Brahma, the creator, the physical, the, the born creator, as opposed to the unborn creator. So in these seven shells, the lowest of the seven shells, the smallest of the seven shells, was known as the born creator, Brahma. The largest of the seven shells was known as the unborn creator. What the Manu Smriti says is that Brahma, the born creator, was, was nothing other than the incarnation of the unborn creator. Is that spelled That's why Ambu, out of his own inscrutable will, manifest himself as Lord Brahma, the born creator within the seven, lowest of those seven shells. Now, the Vahana of Lord... Bro I'm sorry, what were you going to say, Deborah? Um, I was just... I'm sorry, but the ch I was just checking because... Are you speaking about the, the Lord Brahma, B-R-A-H-M-A? Yes. Okay, sorry, okay. That's different from Brahman. Um, Brahma is the living embodiment, the personification of Brahman, which is the supreme being, the supreme reality. Um, um, at any rate, the, the Lord Brahma um, corresponds to the hermetic tradition of, of the great god called Cosmos. Um, and in the tradition of Kabbalah as the first man, the archetypal man, which is represented by the tree of life, which consists of 32 elements. The 10 sephiroth, which are represented as spheres, and the 22 paths of wisdom, which are the lines, that, the 22 lines that are traditionally drawn to connect those spheres. And those are, in the tradition of Kabbalah, compared to the 32 vertebra in the human spine. The whole of the tree of life, which embraces its 32 parts, was the cosmic head. And the 33rd element, 33rd reality. You know, this goes back to deeply into why there are 33 stages of initiation in Freemasonry and so on. Number 33, very, very important. Um, also emphasized in the uh, Book of Numbers when the uh, Moses is de describing the stages of the Ben Israeli, the sons of Israel, as they leave the land of bondage, Egypt, on their way to the land of liberation, the land of immortality. Jerusalem, the Arcanan. It describes they had different stages in the journey where they set up camp. And the book of Numbers, in the 33rd chapter of the book of Numbers, and you know, remember this is the book of Numbers. So obviously, 
what it's telling us is to pay cl close attention to the numbers here. <laughs> and the 33rd chapter of the book of Numbers describes these stages of the Ben Israelite. And immediately after the 33rd stage is recited, the first 33 stages are recited in an unbroken series, no commentary. Immediately after the 33rd stage is recited, there is a commentary. Commentary is that it was at this 33rd encampment that Aaron, the brother of Moses, ascended Mount Hor, which is not known where it is or what that is. But the word Hor to Moses and would, who just came out of Egypt would have been directly related to Horus, the Lord of the Horizon. And the 33rd, at that, on Mount Hor, Aaron ascended and dropped his mortal coil. He died. Now, what does this represent? What it represents is the, these 33 stages represent these 33 layers of space-time geometry through which the, the soul on the path of immortality who has left the realm of bondage has become liberated he passes through 33 stages to arrive at the shore of this world the cosmic horizon that's why Horus was called the Lord of the Horizon. And that 33rd layer is the first of the seven cosmic shells that embraces the created universe. And it is where the created universe, the concrete form of the created universe, meets the cosmic sea that lies beyond this embryonic fluid that embraces the universe. And that is the station of the born creator. And in the Vedic tradition, the Vahana of, the, of Lord Brahma, the, which corresponds to the, sh, the 33rd sh, layer or the, the lowest of the seven shells, is called the Hansa which means the swan, a white swan. That is the origin of the fairy tale about the goose that laid the golden egg. Um, it's a deep, deep reality that is that was literally cognized on the level of expanded consciousness now let's get back to the divine messenger um, this was all just preliminary to describing what the divine messenger really represents so let's go back to the Egyptian account where it talks in the Edfu temple text what the text described, and we're going to we're seeing here that here we have cultures. We're we're we're, we're developing this whole understanding cross culturally, um, drawing from both the Vedic the Vedic tradition, Sumerian tradition, the Hebrew tradition, the Egyptian tradition. All very different traditions. They worship different gods. They spoke different languages. They had different customs. They lived in different areas. Um, you know, they were a distinct people. They spoke different languages, all that. Yet, somehow, they appear to be talking about the same things. As if all those traditions sprang from a common mother culture. Because those four traditions only go back 
we only have historical records of them or civilizations or cultures going back, you know, maybe three or 4,000 years B.C. Well, Sat Yuga took place, began 10,900-something B.C. That's a long many thousands of years uh, before these disparate, distinct cultures began to emerge on Earth. My belief is that, and what's actually taught in the Vedic text, is that there were seven incarnations, seven divine seers, sages, rishis, who incarnated on Earth at the dawn of the previous age of truth, and they were the incarnations of the unborn creator, known to the Hebrews, known to the Jewish tradition as the seven Elohim, the sevenfold presence of Jehovah, known in the Vedic tradition as the seven rishis, the seven seers, the first and foremost of which is Lord Brahma, who was born from the mouth of the unborn creator himself. And in the Egyptian tradition, as the seven sages. Now let's go into the Egyptian description of this, because it's very telling. The Egyptian myth recorded in the Edfu Temple text says that these seven sages who surveyed the land of Egypt... came from an original homeland of the gods, which is described as an island floating in a vast sea, which had been submerged and destroyed by a cosmic flood. And the seven sages were the only survivors of that flood. And they then sought a new place to recreate their homeland, to recreate the homeland of the gods. And the place they chose was the Nile Valley, the land of Egypt, which was to be designed as an image of heaven, as an image of the homeland of the gods. Now, what does this mean? Are they talking about some island on the earth? Are they talking about some island somewhere else? What are they talking about? It certainly sounds like Atlantis to me, but that may not be correct. Well, Atlantis is another archetype that's there deeply in... Uh, in, in awareness, it was possibly. Uh, we, we'll talk about Atlantis at some other point. Okay. I'm not talking about Atlantis here. Okay. Um, what on a cosmic scale? What they're actually talking about? This island, homeland of the gods, was none other than the cosmic egg, which has a shore onto the cosmic sea in the 33rd layer. Of in the ascending direction. Uh, by the way, that layer um, in my in my book, uh, creating the soul body, I, I go into great depth in this in creating the soul body. I'm kind of giving, uh, uh, which is really kind of an elaboration of this whole concept of which I touch upon in Pillar of Celestial Fire. But it's a much deeper, detailed analysis of the whole situation presented in that book. And, but it's, um, it's necessary to bring this in if we really want to have a deeper understanding of what the divine messenger represents. I mean, the, what's the point of me just reciting what's already in the pillar of celestial fire if you can read it? Um, the, what I'm trying to do here is to bring out stuff that's not specifically said in pillar, but which is elaborated in more detail in some of my other writings and which gives a background, a, a, a larger, deeper picture of what is being touched upon here. Um, 
This cosmic egg can be compared to an island, a golden island floating in a cosmic sea, which has a shore corresponding to the 33rd layer of reality, which um, is on the order of 10 to the 32 centimeters in radius. It's actually 2 times 10 to the 32 centimeters. It's 2 times 10 to the 32, or 1 times 10 to the 32 digits. Um, and that's on the order of, it's a huge, huge distance. And that was viewed as the lifespan of the creator, but it actually means the light span of the creator. And this goes back to the book of John where it says, you know, um, it's talking about the, the God and the logos and so on. And, and it says that, you know, everything that was created was pervaded by, by God. And that light and, and, and the, the light shone in the darkness and the darkness never mastered it. And that light was the life of men. It's an equation between light and life. Same thing is done in the Vedic tradition where the lifespan of the creator can be interpreted as the light span of the creator measured in light years. Actually, there is a algorithm given um, in a 14th century um, commentary on the Rig Veda by a, a, a sage named, named uh, um, Sayana, um, which accurately gives a very accurate estimate to be within less than 1% of the speed of light. And that was some 300 years prior to the speed of light was first discovered by a European by studying the orbits of the moons of Jupiter. Um, but it's very accurate prediction, and in, in Sinus commentary, it says, um, thus it is remembered, and he gave the algorithm. Talking about a very ancient knowledge that was there long, long ago. That's, that's sensational. I wonder if modern science has any idea that that exists. Well, actually, this was originally, I didn't discover this. This was originally discovered by um, um, an uh, electrical engineer at Louisiana State University who was an Indian uh, professor, hmm. professor of electrical engineering. Mm -hmm. And he had somehow, this had been brought to his attention, and he wanted to see if, uh, if this was actually, because what the algorithm talking about, uh, what the, 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 the hymn in the Rig Veda that is being commented on by, by Sayana pertains to the sun. And it's talking about the light of the sun. And it's referring to this light or jyoti as that which travels, traverses so many yojanas per so many nimeshas. These a yojana is a unit of, of, of distance and a nimesha is a Vedic unit of time. And when you do the calculation, it gives... Um, the speed of light to within less than 1%. <laughs> Whoa. That's just amazing, um, amazing. Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. Uh, there's a lot of amazing things um, that when you really start looking into these ancient traditions, um, your hair stands on end because you realize that they had a science, a cosmic science, that is in many ways much more profound and 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 actually predictive, um, much more profound than modern science, but actually yields accurate predictions about the radii of the celestial bodies and, and also the fundamental scales of force matter unification that have recently become known in quantum theory. Um, all of these things can be, and I go, that's what my book, Creating the Soul Body, is all about, is this whole uh, profound what the, what the hermetic sage is called the system of measured arrangement in the creation which they and this is this is presented in a discourse this this whole knowledge about the system of measured arrangement is presented in the hermetic text in a discourse between Isis the goddess Isis and her son Horus 
And she tells her son Horus that her ancestors, this is to emphasize the antiquity of this knowledge, that the ancestors of Isis, who was one of the first of the Egyptian goddesses in the Egyptian tradition, that her ancestors taught that the space between heaven and earth, this goes back to this whole thing of the divine messenger, the space between heaven and earth is organized in layers, some of which are some which of which some people call zones, others call firmaments. This is her words, or the words of the Hermetic text. I'm not making this up. Some are called zones, some are called firmaments, and these are the haunts of the souls that have been released from their bodies. Now, by release from their bodies, there's a twofold meaning. It means that a soul is released from their body in two ways. By physically dying, the soul gets released from the body, and the soul also gets released from the body when the soul becomes enlightened or liberated from the body, which can happen while the body is living. So um, these are the layers that are experienced by liberated consciousness on its journey towards full immortality in the bosom of the infinite. It's an ascending journey that the Egyptians compared to climbing a stairway to the sky. Described multiple times in the oldest text, religious text of Egypt called the Pyramid Texts, which we've already discussed. In those texts, it was also described as a divine ladder that leads from he earth to heaven. Well, we have a description of that in the book of Genesis, where Jacob rests on his way to Haran and places his head on a stone. We're talking about the Philosopher's Stone here, really, symbolically. And based upon that, resting his head upon the stone, he had a vision of a divine ladder that stretched between heaven and earth and he saw the angels, the messengers of God, ascending and descending the divine ladder. Excuse me, Robert? Was this the same time where he actually, was this the same event at which he wrestled with an angel? And no. No, it's a completely different event? No, this is when he, well, you know, I mean, <clears throat> this stone is supposedly, supposedly, the coronation stone used and placed under the throne, which is in Westminster Abbey, that uh, the, the royalty of Britain is uh, coronated using this, this stone, which is supposedly the stone of Jacob. That was actually... Now, whether it is or not, we don't know. But that was that's, given that's, back to, to Scotland, actually. The Stone of Scone is what you're talking about, right? The Stone of Scone. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It was returned to... Uh, oh, was it? Yeah. But some people say that never was the real one. It was a substitute. No, it's symbolic. Yeah, it's symbolic. I'm sure it is. I, I, I believe that what was actually being discussed there was the uh, the Philosopher's Stone. Mm -hmm. um, and it goes back to Haran as being this location where... Um, was the cult center for the moon god Sin, as Heliopolis was the cult center for, this, for the moon god Tehuti Athoth in the Egyptian tradition. And uh, Haran is a place, um, actually they've just discovered some, uh, some standing stones, just on Earth recently, about 20 miles from Haran, um, which are the oldest known monuments ever built on the Earth dated back to the 10th millennium BC. And there are inscriptions and carvings on those stones. 
just discovered within the last few years. Uh, if you go online, you can look it up. And it's near a town called Sani Lurfa, which in ancient times was called Urfa, and in even more ancient times was called Ur, a little village about 20 miles from Haran. And it is there <laughs> that the entire Muslim world, who traces its patriarch back to Abraham, as do the Jews, it is there that the entire Muslim world believes that Abraham, the father of Jacob, was born. Which would have made sense because the book of Genesis tells us that Abraham traveled from his home city of Ur and towards Egypt, towards Canaan and then eventually Egypt, and the first stop on his journey was Haran which is 20 miles away, a day's journey. And it was there that his father, Terah, passed away. And that was the cult center of the wisdom god, the divine messenger in the Semitic tradition. Not the Jewish, tradi the Hebrew tradition, but more the larger Semitic tradition, right? Yeah, because at that time, there was not really... A Jewish religion. That's right. Jewish religion emerged with Moses. He invented the Jewish religion and 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 taught it to the people that he brought out of Egypt. And that's where the Jewish religion started. That's where the Book of Genesis was written. Now there was a Semitic lore, according to rabbinical traditions. There was a Semitic lore that went back long before the first five books of the Bible were written down, and it was called the uh, spoken Torah, the oral Torah, as opposed to the written Torah. And supposedly the spoken Torah, the oral Torah, was at least 50 times larger in content than the written lore, lore that became the first five, the Pentateuch, and the, the first five books of the, of the Bible, the Old Testament. And that what Moses really did was was to summarize and synopsize the, uh, the oral teachings because um, he was worried that it would become forgotten, that men's minds were becoming um, not capable of, of retaining the memory that they had previously. And he was worried that it would become written, uh, forgotten. So um, he put it down as really, and what the rabbinical tra uh, tradition tells us is that it was the written Torah was really written first five books of the Bible were written as a memory aid, kind of like shorthand for the real oral tradition. Well, the real oral tradition is, is a term that is used for Kabbalah before it got written down as well. Yep. Well, yeah. all these old traditions were originally oral traditions, and they eventually became written down when the mind of man was no longer capable of Retaining. Yeah. yeah, retaining the kind of vast memory that was there previously. Um, uh, let's go back to our story. So we got off track here a little bit. Um, go back to the Egyptians. And their story about the seven sages, their homeland got submerged and lost. And uh, they were the only survivors. Well... Here's a clue. Okay, if the 33rd layer is the shore of this world, and it's the first of the seven shells, then the highest of the seven shells, the largest of the seven shells, will be the 39th layer. That is the outermost shell of the cosmic egg. the deepest recesses of the cosmic sea that lies beyond the created form of the universe. What lies beyond that? What lies beyond that is the 40th layer. The 40th stage. Which in the tradition of Kabbalah 
is identified with the I am that I am. In the Vedic tradition, it was identified with the all-pervading reality of the Supreme Being, known as Vishnu, um, which literally comes from the root Vish, which means to pervade, and Vishnu literally means the all-pervading being. And what lies beyond the cosmic egg was described by the Vedic seers as the Akshara Brahman, the imperishable ever-expanding wholeness. In the Vishnu Purana, in the Brahma Purana, and a variety of other Puranas, it's described in some detail, that reality, which is always referred to as that, because it represents Brahman, not an embodiment of Brahman, but Brahman itself, the supreme reality itself. And the Akshara Brahman, the imperishable reality, everything that exists within the cosmic egg was viewed as perishable to some degree or another. What lies outside the cosmic egg was viewed as imperishable, indestructible, eternal, cannot be destroyed. And what that is said that the imperishable wholeness contains, <laughs> contains are an infinite number of cosmic eggs just like our own. The radius of the from the from center of the universe to the outermost the first shell of the cosmic egg which is the the station of the born creator, that we, the 33rd layer, um, is on the order of 311 trillion light years. Now, uh, that is 311 followed by 12 zeros. Light years. Uh, 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 light tr uh, travels at what is it, 286,000 miles per second or something like that? Something like that, yeah. Uh, very fast. Travels a long way in one second. Travels a very long way in one year. Now just imagine how far it travels in 311 trillion years. The light span of the Creator. It is huge. What the Vedic seers said is that when you reach the level of the Akshara Brahman, the cosmic egg, which contains billions and billions and billions of galaxies, appears to be no bigger than an infinitesimal point. An atom in the perishable, infinite, and eternal, immortal body of the Supreme Being. Excuse me, Robert. With all those, uh, but it, what's interesting is you're saying you use the term imperishable, but there are entities or universes or cosmic eggs, billions of them within the imperishable, that though they are perishable, do not impact the imperishability of the uh, Akshara Brahman, yeah. Correct, correct. That the, what happens, <clears throat> when they say the cosmic egg is perishable, what they're talking about is the created forms and phenomena that exist within the first, within the golden yoke is perishable. Because it's created. What can be created is, can be destroyed. And the cycles of creation and dissolution span, according to the Vedic text, 311 trillion years. 
The seven shells of the cosmic egg do not consist of created substance. It's primordial, uncreated substance. So whether the created universe exists or not, the seven shells persist for all times. And they serve as the link, the rainbow, the covenant between the imperishable heaven of the supreme being and the perishable earth of mortal beings. That is the true nature of the divine messenger that connects heaven and earth. And that divine messenger, you know, we'll get into the reality that lies beyond the cosmic egg. I mean, this is the whole myth of the phoenix, too. Um, you know, the phoenix hatches from the cosmic egg. When it breaks through the outermost shell, of the, when, the, when the soul, the, the aspiring soul, breaks through the outermost shell of the cosmic egg and enters into the imperishable wholeness, the, the immortal heaven, of the supreme being, it attains true immortality. Um, when, and that is attained on the 40th layer, the 40th stage. Now, this goes back to a myth in the book of Genesis about the cosmic flood and how that cosmic flood, the flood of Noah, is related to the cosmic flood described in the Edfu temple texts. Now, of course, all of these ancient texts, they have some historical, probably, most likely, some historical basis. But these are written as myths, and myths are, um, are not histories. Myths are um, histories that have been massaged, histories that have been refashioned to present spiritual truth, to describe and embody spiritual principles, um, archetypes, which have a deeper meaning than the surface level of what's being described as some story. And in the book of, uh, in the description of Noah, the, the, the myth of Noah, you have a, uh, a man named Noah who is informed by God that, you know, there's a great flood coming. So build your ark and take pairs of all created beings and put them in the ark. And uh, I haven't talked about this yet, but there's these layers that are ascending are matched by a, an equal number of layers that are descending. And that which is ascending and that which is descending, I mean, the Rig Veda states that, specifically states, those steps that are called ascending are also termed descending and those which are called descending are also called ascending this goes back to the, what we talked about with the emerald tablet earlier that which is above corresponds to that which is below that which is below corresponds to that which is above and just as there are increasingly macroscopic cosmic scales of space-time geometry that lead towards the imperishable wholeness. There's also a set of microscopic, microscopic increasingly subtle, increasingly small scales of time and space that lead to the Akshara Brahman. You know, that's why 
the Vedic texts state that Brahman, Supreme Being, is that which is both larger than the largest, Mahato Mahiyan, and smaller than the smallest, Anor Aniyan. It's an Upanishadic aphorism. And when the awareness of the liberated soul ascends the divine ladder, it simultaneously descends the divine ladder, such that his, its awareness expands to embrace larger and larger wholes of creation, while it simultaneously descends to grasp the smaller and smaller parts out of which those holes are fashioned. And through the process of simultaneous analysis of the whole into parts and the synthesis of the parts into the whole, it obtains complete knowledge about the expanding reality of the universe and what lies beyond the universe. That knowledge is the essence and the mechanics of how consciousness becomes liberated and how consciousness ascends and descends the divine ladder is the essence of what the divine messengers have to teach on earth to human beings. It is the path of immortality. And what they teach in terms of their theory regarding the path of immortality, they not only taught theoretical knowledge, but they also taught the practical knowledge of how to realize that. And that is the science of alchemy. The elixirs can be compared to the fuels, the food that the soul requires to make the journey. It's the fuel that allows the vehicle of the soul to traverse all the layers and arrive at the goal. Now, going back to this, the myth of Noah tells us that after he built the ark, it rained for 40 days and 40 nights. Why 40 days and 40 nights? <coughs> what is, this is, this is, there's meaning here, hidden meaning. The 40 days correspond to the 40 layers of expansion. The 40 nights correspond to the 40 layers of contraction or descent. And they're organized in matched pairs like day and night. 40 days and 40 nights. And what you arrive at on the 40th day and 40 night, 40th night is the shore of the other world, the new world, the new immortal land, which is the goal of the journey. Now, it's very made very clear in the Vedic text that what happens as the soul ascends and descends through these layers, that when you reach the shore of this world, corresponding to the 33rd layer, the layer of the unborn creator, where Aaron supposedly dropped his physicality, he died on Mount Hor, the horizon of this world, 33rd layer which embodies the whole of the tree of life. When the soul reaches that stage, um, 
it stands at the juncture between the physical and the metaphysical, between that which is created and that which is uncreated. That which is created can be called physical, and that which is uncreated can be called metaphysical, which is beyond the physical, beyond the created. And when you leave that shore to enter into, which is identified in the Vedic tradition with the shell of earth, when you leave that shore and enter into the sea, the cosmic sea, that surrounds the universe. You are entering in to the shell of water. This is the next highest shell. It extends ten times beyond the shell of Earth. That means it's ten times three hundred and eleven trillion light years radius. Now, it's almost inconceivably huge. It's 10 times 311 trillion light years is the shell of water. And when the soul enters into that shell, it literally observes the created universe being dissolved into the sea of primordial mind stuff out of which the shell of water is composed. As if in a great cosmic flood. The island homeland of the gods, the created universe, filled with celestial beings in the forms of stars and galaxies and so on, is dissolved. It's submerged in the sea of primordial mind stuff. And as, it, as the soul proceeds to ascend further through the seven shells, this submersion becomes more and more abstract. In the shell of fire, above the shell of water, the soul experiences the submerged universe being consumed by what is called submarine fire, the Vedic tradition literally called submarine fire. It's a direct translation of a Sanskrit word. And when it ascends into the well, uh, shell of, of air, in the shell of fire, the universe is reduced to ashes, point values of consciousness, which are essentially elementary particles. still created elementary particles, but they're like ashes, they're like points, they're like ashes of the universe. You're not seeing the universe on the scale of atoms and material things, objects and so on. You're experiencing it on the level of the elementary particles themselves. And when you ascend to the shell of air, those particles are blown away. The ashes are blown away. That means they dissolve into a subtler form of mind stuff that is endowed with what's described in the Rig Veda as a salilam apricatum, which means an indistinguishable flow. A flow that is indistinguishable from non-flow. Motion that is indistinguishable from non-motion. That's, that's what the universe appears as in the shell of air. When you ascend beyond the shell of air into the shell of space, all motion disappears, even the indistinguishable motion, and what appears is 
absolute stillness, a non-moving void of consciousness, which can be characterized as space itself, cosmic space we're talking about, cosmic space that is thousands somewhat, ten hundred thousand is ten thousand times three hundred and eleven trillion light years in radius. And when you ascend beyond the shell of space into the shell of cosmic ego, a hunkar. I do. One experiences the entire universe being dissolved into the type of primordial mind stuff that characterizes the cosmic ego, the doer. The cosmic doer. Which, so to speak, creates space. The other, the other creates space and creates motion and creates luminosity and creates flow and creates appearance of substance and it creates the appearance of created created universe. And it's there that the soul witnesses the destruction of the cosmic ego. The cosmic ego his identity, let's put it this way. Ego basically is what it, it, the soul causes the soul to become identified with something. You know, we are identified with our body. That identification is a function of ego. We're identified with what we observe. That identification is a function of the ego. Well, in the shell of cosmic ego, the identification of the soul with the created universe and everything that's in it is destroyed. The cosmic ego is dissolved. You no longer, the soul no longer identifies itself with the created universe or anything in it. And then finally, and ultimately, this is the place where there is the cosmic sacrifice, where the, the mortal vestiges of the soul, whatever remaining mortal vestiges of the soul are there, are ripped to shreds, and the mortal soul becomes utterly annihilated. At that point, The soul, cosmic soul, we're talking about a soul of unimaginable greatness, magnitude, becomes helpless and drifts into the final cosmic shell, which is a shell of cosmic intelligence, the very abode or station of the unborn creator himself. But as the soul is ascending through the layers, the unborn creator appears to be the unborn destroyer. And as it drifts into the mouth, the hollow space of the unborn destroyer, the soul enters into a state of complete oblivion. Complete ignorance of anything whatsoever. Like being locked inside of a cosmic tomb in a state of absolute but you can't really say it's unconsciousness because there is no such thing really as unconsciousness. 
I mean, even when we are unconscious in sleep, you know, I mean, that's still called a state of consciousness. It's called the sleeping state of consciousness. And the truth is, you know, the Vedic Seers are very clear about it. The consciousness can neither be created nor can it be destroyed. It is eternal. Um, the, it can only change forms. Um, but consciousness itself is eternally conserved. It is absolute, immortal. It can take, take on different qualities according to what it is aware of. And in the outermost shell of the cosmic egg, the awareness of the soul is aware of nothing, no thing other than pure cosmic intelligence itself. But that is without any object or intelligent reflection. And it is completely helpless in that state. It cannot think a thought. It cannot experience anything whatsoever. Not, not, it's not an abstract relation with the universe. It can't experience space. It can't experience motion or time. It can't experience form revealed by light. It can't experience flow. It can't experience any substance. It doesn't experience anything. Because it has entered into the mouth of the unborn destroyer and been totally consumed. That is the cosmic sacrifice. And it takes a great hero to make that cosmic sacrifice. Essentially, at this point, the island homeland of the gods has been completely swallowed up by the sea of primordial mind stuff, uncreated mind stuff, and reduced to a mere nothing. Then the soul, by the grace of the Supreme Being, is carried across that final stage in its journey. This is symbolic of the myth of Osiris, who was the king of the world, the cosmic ego of the world who was tricked into a cosmic coffin by his brother Set and his 72 co-conspirators. Number 72 is very significant. I won't get into it here. It's too much detail. But um, he entered in the coffin alive and was locked inside alive. And the coffin was set adrift on the Nile River. And he died in isolation, all alone, in silent darkness of his cosmic tomb, as it floated down the Nile into the Mediterranean Sea, until it eventually washed up on the other shore, which in the Alexandrian version of the myth corresponds to the shore of Lebanon. Actually, it says it washed up at Byblos. Now, very interesting here. Byblos is the, the, the word that the Bible is named after. Because at the time that the Bible means the book, basically. And um, Byblos was a port city uh, in Phoenicia, which uh, was famous for producing uh, paper products. 
uh, produced the first paper out of wood and various other plant substances. It produced paper upon which it could be written. And it was famous for this. And so any book was called a, a, uh, a Bible. Bible was a book. And Bible is the book. Um, that was give the name given to it by the uh, early Christians. But the word originally has its roots from Biblos. Anyway, that's the place where Osiris washed up on the shore there. And eventually he was discovered and blah, 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 blah. But what, what that's talking about is the final stage of the journey. Um, and of course, Lebanon is in the land of Canaan, which is what the Jews also viewed as the land of immortality. Now, there's some really interesting stuff going on here between Egyptian and, and Hebrew myth. Um, I mean, why is it that the Egyptians would have equated the land of immortality with Canaan? which at that time embraced um, not only Jerusalem or uh, what is now modern-day Jerusalem, but also Lebanon and Syria. It was large was the land called Canaan. Um, but it's right there in the Egyptian myth as told by the, uh, the authors who were studying these ancient texts that had been produced and ferreted out by the Ptolemies and, and stored in the great library of Alexandria. They were, re they were basically uh, giving detailed explanations of these ancient myths and secrets were coming out at this time. And one of the secrets had to do with the fact that the Egyptians viewed the other shore, the shore of immortality, as corresponding to Lebanon. Anyway, um, and the point there is, go ahead, why don't you buckle that buckle and explain why? Um, well, I think it's going to take too much uh, to explain why. We can maybe address that. would take a whole another whole nother, uh, discussion to get into okay. uh, land symbolism in Egypt, right. um, in the Egyptian tradition. Uh, there's, a, there's a great deal of... of uh, very interesting stuff that's going on with land symbolism in Egypt. But um, it's, it, it would require way too much to develop and would take us too far afield at this point to get into it. Um, but essentially, um, uh, going back to the myth of Noah, what, 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 is being, what it's depicting there is the 40 days and 40 nights is the path of the soul ascending um, through all the layers and through the final seven shells to arrive at the 40th stage, which is the shore of the other world. And that's, he discovers the mountaintop that rises out of the ocean, which eventually the water settles down and a new earth is um, revealed, which is to be, be populated and, and everything is to start over anew. And that's exactly what happens when you reach the, sh the shore of the other world. You begin a new life, a new immortal life. It's very different than what you've experienced up to that phase. Now, when the soul reaches that scale and breaks through the outermost shell of the cosmic egg, he awakens to a completely different type of reality, or it awakens to a completely different type of reality. And... From that perspective, looking back towards the universe, he sees, or the soul sees, that the seven shells are imperishable. They link the immortal reality of the Supreme Being with the mortal reality of the created universe, Earth. The immortal heaven, the mortal Earth. And it resembles a rainbow. And what the 
the Hermetic texts tell us have something to say about this. And so, you know, what has survived the flood? What has survived the flood? The cosmic flood. Well, the seven shells, the embodiments of the seven seers, the seven sages, the seven purushas, the seven cosmic souls have survived the cosmic flood as described in the Egyptian myth recorded in the temple walls of the temple of Edfu. Um, and then what's required is a recreation of the universe which has been dissolved in the awareness of the soul See, this is all an appearance and disappearance in consciousness. Just because the soul ascends and experiences everything is dissolving doesn't mean that everything in the universe is actually being destroyed. It's a subjective vision of, what's, of what the soul is experiencing, literally and concretely, as it ascends through this whole thing. But when the soul reaches the 40th level, he becomes identified with, or she becomes identified with, or it becomes identified with, the Supreme Being. And the awareness is turned back towards creation to review the, the journey it has just progressed through. It may have taken billions of years to, for the soul to awaken to develop to the point where it becomes liberated and makes this journey but it looks back on its journey and in looking back its awareness descends back through the seven shells and when it descends to the seven shells when it enters into the outermost shell the awareness becomes identified with the unborn creator and as it progresses through the seven shells, the universe appears to be recreated in its awareness. But this time, the soul that's observing this creation is standing outside the universe, looking within. So as its awareness descends back through the seven shells and reaches the shell of the of the born creator the soul becomes identified with the born creator and it can continue to contract and this is what brings about divine incarnations And there's a very interesting um, passage in the Hermetic text, which were written by a group of scholars from all over the Hellenistic Empire who came together in uh, Alexandrian Egypt um, to study the great scrolls that had been ferreted out from the Egyptian temples by the Ptolemies. And they put together these texts, which are kind of synthesis, a synthesis and a synopsis of uh, many great doctrines that were hidden in those texts, and and the and the, the authors claim to be presenting the 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 oldest and most true philosophic spirit of old kingdom Egypt. But they're doing so because it's in, during the Hellenistic Empire, they're expressing their writings in Greek language and uh, drawing upon Greek philosophical ideas to express this Egyptian wisdom. And what they say is that they describe these seven sages as seven um, administrators of the universe whose working is called destiny. And they're identified with seven spheres that embrace all that exists. Seven shells. And what it said about them, and then it's, the, the authors say in this particular 
section where it's describing the seven administrators. It says, and now I'm going to tell you a secret, most secret, which has never been revealed till this day. Obviously, the author's talking about something that was hidden in the ancient scrolls, which has never been revealed before to the public. What he goes on to say says, with the creation of man on earth, nature mingled with nature. And in so far as the character of man reflected the character of the heavens, this allowed for seven, the seven cosmic administrators to be born as seven men on earth. This is the secret that they ferreted out of the Egyptian text. It's a doctrine of divine incarnation. Same doctrine you find in the Vedic tradition. And it says that so things remained for a period. It's talking about the first period, Zeptepi, Satya Yuga when the seven sages incarnated on earth and traversed the earth to measure that which has previously been unmeasured, to set all beings in their proper order and to establish their lineage as an extended bloodline of offspring in different lands. That is what I just said is almost an exact quote out of the Rig Veda. And the Rig Veda goes on to say that they traverse the, sh the earth as men traverse the earth, the sea in a ship. This is some very heavy stuff with respect to, from a historical perspective. But what the implication is, is that the divine messenger wasn't just one person. It was the presence of the unborn and born creators, because they're just different ends of the same spectrum manifesting on earth the sevenfold presence manifesting on earth in the form of seven men seven godlike men who came to teach the science of immortality to put all beings on earth on the proper path the path of immortality and to provide them with the means to accomplish that practical means which is the practical science of alchemy that's why the earliest Egyptian the earliest authors in the Alexandrian period on alchemy and that we know of in the West the, the earliest surviving text on alchemy that we have in the West come out of Alexandria in Egypt. And what they say is that the science of alchemy was originally written in a magical book. And it was written and brought to earth by fallen angels. which means descended angels. Of course, the word angel 
directly tied back to the Angirasas in the Vedic tradition, which is just a word to describe these seven sages. It's just a word in one language, and it's been translated into another, been morphed into another language. But I'm, I, I'm not saying that the Angirasas in the Vedic tradition were the guys. They were the guys. What I'm saying is that they were the same guys that surveyed the Nile River Valley and were known by the Egyptians as their seven sages and were known by the Sumerians as their seven sages, known by the Hebrew tradition as their seven Elohim. They were the same group who simply traveled from land to land cohabited with the native population on that land to create their own blood lineage of offspring who would possess the mother tradition. And that's why all these traditions tell pretty much the same story and have very similar myths. And when you look into the numbers and uh, what they're really talking about, you see that they possess the same science of immortality. They mapped out what I demonstrated in my book, Creating the Soul Body, is that the Vedic tradition, the Hebrew tradition, the Egyptian tradition, we don't have that much detailed information, surviving text from the Sumerian tradition, but we do from these other three. I show that they counted exactly the same number of steps on the path of immortality. They understood them in exactly the same way. And, and that that sequence had, there was a, a, a system of measured arrangement associated with all of that, which is predictive. You can use it to predict the radius of the sun accurately within an order of magnitude. The radius of the sun, the radius of our heliosphere, the radius of our galaxy, the radius of the dark matter halo that surrounds the galaxy, the radius of the visible universe. And that's where modern science ends. Modern science can predict all of those radiuses as well based upon empirical observation. Well, this ancient system of measurement can predict them as well based upon the, based upon the, the intuitive visionary cognition of the ancient seers who actually can see the reality inside their own expanding awareness. So, the divine messenger is a very heavy concept, needless to say. And in the book of Revelations, going back to chapter 3, um, there's a great deal of symbolism in the passages that I quote in Pillar of Celestial Fire, um, which I explain in terms of, well, <clears throat> at the beginning of that passage, what, what it says is that it describes, the author says, After this I looked, and there before my eyes was a door opened in heaven. And the voice that I had first heard speaking to me like a trumpet said, Come up here, and I will show you what must happen hereafter. In other words, he had to ascend his consciousness had to expand into heaven to be able to know what's going to happen hereafter. And this has to do with the, what the symbology that's, that's depicted later on, and I describe it in some depth, um, depicts the throne of heaven. And the throne of heaven is um, also described uh, in the apocryphal book of Enoch um, as a throne made of crystal in a 
dwelling made of crystal whose floors, walls, and everything was made of crystal. And what he's talking about here is the throne of heaven is the crystalline structure of the imperishable Brahman, the crystalline structure where the atoms in this infinite crystal correspond to cosmic eggs that exist in a perfect symmetric arrangement indicative of unbounded and infinite cosmic intelligence that exists outside of our universe which is the same thing as saying that it exists at every point inside our universe <clears throat> because as the expand <coughs> awareness expands towards infinity it simultaneously contracts towards a point and there's such a point at every point in space inside and outside the universe And so what's outside is also inside. What's outside is, is reflected at every point in space in creation on the level of consciousness. The Greeks called this the metaphysical logos. The Vedic seers called it the Veda. The Egyptians called it the duat, the underworld, the foundation of the visible world the invisible foundation of the visible world. And of course the Hebrews called it the tree of life, which consists of spheres connected by lines and geometry and so on. <clears throat> this may be a good resting place, may, perhaps uh, a, you've given out a great deal of information in this talk. and um, Yeah, I'm hoping it wasn't too technical and abstract um, but I wanted to give a deeper flushing of fleshing out of what I touched upon in this in this book and if you go back and look at the the symbology that's described in chapter three I think you'll see, you'll have a new perspective on what's being talked about with the seven flames correspond to the seven fold aspect of the divine messenger uh I don't think it was, it seemed quite clear the way you described it. And I just want to point out that it's a very good preparation for the material of the third course, which will be creating soul body. And we'll be able to go into it in even greater depth at that time. And I'm sure you'll touch on it as we go forward as well, up until that time. Because yeah, you see, it's very difficult to... Talk about one piece of this whole picture in isolation, because really and truly, it's a hologram. Um, and a hologram is simply a piece of film you shine coherent light through it, and no matter how small the piece, it reflects the whole. And uh, at least in my vision, it's holographic. And so when I start talking about one piece of it, I'm afraid that I tend to bring in all of it <laughs> but that's how knowledge is structured because it, there's a constant what's required to really understand and grasp anything is an alternation between a vision of the whole and a vision of the parts so when we start with a part we will expand it to the whole and we'll try to bring it back to the part. And by this process of analysis and synthesis, knowledge gets structured in consciousness and it becomes firmly established in consciousness. What we're doing is a kind of meditation on the subjects that we're discussing here. And uh, hopefully 
uh, it will have that effect upon the listeners as it has in me because I am structuring knowledge in my own awareness and I'm hoping that you are also structuring knowledge in your awareness. It's a, it, thank you for for gifting us with the opportunity to 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 do you to do that with you and follow you in your in the path that you've blazed for us in in, in and bringing it back to us, Robert. I'm sure that everybody listening will join in in my sense of appreciation to you. Okay, look forward to seeing you next time, Deb. Okay, thank you. Bye.